The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. All right, let's go ahead and start. Row number one, row number one. What was the message that you received? Spread the good news about the Savior. Spread the good news about the Savior. Let's see how well the message started. Go ahead. and This was the first message. I bring you good news of great joy. A Savior has been born in Bethlehem. <laughs> <laughs> I think something got lost in translation along the way. All right, let's do row number two. Uh, what was the message that you received? I bring you good news of great joy. You're kidding, right? <laughs> what was the message that they started with? The Word became flesh and lived among us, the one and only Son of the Father. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, move on to row number three. What was the message you received? The Christian church is the best church in the world. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let's see how they started that message. Pastor Roger and Chandler Christian Church are the best in the world. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My mother, who was here today, wrote that message, just to let you know that, okay? You know, I think number three did the best. What do you guys think, all right? All right, we've got a gift for you. You get to go to 242 Cafe and get a free pastry and a free coffee. You're going to get a certificate to do that. You know, don't we all like good news? And don't we all like to have messages? And don't we all like to know something that other people don't know and then try to communicate to them? Now, it's not easy. It's hard to get the message right. I mean, look at the example here. In fact, row two, I have no idea where you guys were. But, <laughs> but the, whole, the whole beauty of it is getting the message and communicating it. And at Christmas time, we all get gifts, great gifts. And, and, and when you're really, really good one, you want to tell somebody else about it. You want to share that good news with other people. And that's what exactly happened 2,000 years ago. So I'm going to remind you of the story, this simple, simple story this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. If you didn't bring your Bible, shame on you. You should always bring your Bible. We've got the verses printed for you there. But Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. Now, this is really cool. This is really amazing because the historical aspect of it is just a, a, a blaze of a fulfilled prophecy and verification. These are real people. Caesar Augustus was a real guy. We know when he ruled in Rome. We know that he ruled from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. So we have a timeline and a real person that we can verify. Now, historically, there's a little bit of a problem with the dating of Quirinius as the governor of Syria uh, because Quirinius actually became the governor after Jesus was born. But if you look at the text correctly and critically in the Greek language, the word potos is there, which means first, but can also mean beginning. And the fact is that Quirinius actually served as a tacit governor of Syria during the time of the birth of Christ. He was officially named governor after Jesus was born. So it really fits the pattern, and yet it is even more exact. It gives us dates and times and places that we can verify. Every 14 years, the Roman government did a census of the world that they occupied in order to create a tax base. We all understand paying taxes, don't we? And they also wanted to make sure they had enough men who they could recruit for military if they needed to go into a great battle. So each male member of a family was to return to their own ancestral home. Not the home where they lived, but their ancestral home. And there they were to register their name and their occupation and their property and their family members. So, in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee and Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the lineage or the ancestry of David. He was there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
Now, there's some prophetic stuff here that would just blow your mind. If we had time to talk about it, the fulfilled prophecy is absolutely amazing. Just give you a sample here. The Bible says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, 80 miles away. And they had no reason to go back to Bethlehem. They were uh, built in and, and working and had their place in Nazareth. And so in order for them to get Bethlehem, something would have to move them. And God did. God used a non-believer, Caesar, to demand this census be taken. And everyone had to return to their ancestral home. So God used a non-believer in order to help fulfill this prophecy that they would go back to Bethlehem. The Bible also says that the Messiah had to be a descendant of David. And Joseph is of the lineage and the descendancy of David. So is Mary, by the way. But Mary's ancestor was, uh, was the, one of the sons of David that was not in the kingly line. Joseph was of the lineage of Solomon, the king of Israel. And because of that, his line could be king. Here's the problem. The problem is that Joseph isn't the father of Jesus. God is. But Joseph adopted Jesus to be his son and thus fulfills the prophecy that David's son would occupy the throne of Israel forever and ever. Amazing. And if you remember, as we went through the story, that Bethlehem is the home of Ruth and Boaz. Some of you were with us when we did the story of the kinsman redeemer, where one who is estranged from the family could be brought back into the family if someone within the family would bring them in. And so in fulfillment of that prophecy and that example, Jesus, God, was born in human flesh so that he was fully man as well as fully God. And he was qualified to be our kinsman redeemer. Though we are estranged from God, he's the one who's qualified to bring us back into relationship with God. It's absolutely amazing fulfilled prophecy that took place when the baby was born in Bethlehem. Excuse me. <coughs> I just know it, all right? We may do it again. Hang on there. Um, so they traveled some 80 miles south uh, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And how did they get there? Did they ride? Did Mary ride on a donkey? I don't know. Have no idea that she ride in a wagon. We just don't know in the scripture. You know, I'm, I'm, my guess is that she may, may have ridden on Joseph's back all the way down. Why do we have to go to Bethlehem? Why do we have to go all the way down there? Don't you know how pregnant I am? You know how hard it is to get down? I don't know. But they probably walked that 80 miles down. And took time to get to the journey down to Bethlehem. And when they arrived, because everyone had gone to their own ancestral place, the place was filled. And there was no place for them to stay. The Bible never says there's an innkeeper. It just simply says there was no place for them to stay. No inn where they could stay. And so they found a place for the baby to be born. Probably a stable, probably cut into the side of one of the limestone cliffs that were in that region, in that area. And uh, Mary uh, gave birth and they took that baby, wrapped that baby in strips of cloth, and they laid him in a feeding trough. The word translated manger is literally feeding cloth. It probably was a rough hewn stone place where they would put the feed. They probably cleaned off that stone platform, and they laid the baby Jesus there. What an amazing gift. I read a story about a children's Christmas program in a church where they were assigning the, uh, the, the roles for the play. And one little boy really wanted to be Joseph, but he wasn't selected to be Joseph. He was selected to be the innkeeper. And he didn't want to be the innkeeper, and he didn't like the little boy who was selected to be Joseph. And so as the play went on, he hatched a plot to get back at this Joseph. And he didn't do anything during all the practices or even the dress rehearsal. But on the night of the Christmas pageant, before the church and before all the families, uh, when Joseph and Mary came to the door of the inn and knocked on the door, uh, the innkeeper, who was angry, uh, went to the door and opened it up and said gruffly, what are you guys doing here? And Joseph said, according to his line, we'd like to have a room for the night. And suddenly this mean-spirited boy, the innkeeper, flung the door open and said, well, come on in. I'll give you the best room in the house. Joseph didn't know what to do at first, and then he caught on to the trick. And he stepped inside the door, and he looked one way and looked the other way and stepped back out and said, I wouldn't let my wife stay in this dump for all the money in the world. Come on, honey, let's find a stable somewhere. And thus the play continued. Well, the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men upon whom his favor rests. I mean, think about this. The shepherds are just out minding their own business, taking care of their sheep late at night, sitting around a fire perhaps, listening to the crickets chirp, the, the sheep bleeding quietly in the background, when all of a sudden... The sky opens up, and this burst of light shines forth. It's just one at first, like a spotlight, and the angel appears and gives this amazing, amazing message. And then all of a sudden, the entire sky breaks forth in angelic choir, and they begin to chant the words, glory to God in the highest, and then they're gone. I mean, it was this huge bright light, and then they're gone. And I have to think to myself that the shepherds were just amazed at this sign, amazed at this circumstance. And so they were told to go see the Lamb of God. These shepherds were probably the same ones who were caring for the sheep that were to be used to sacrifice. On the hills of Bethlehem, just a few miles from Jerusalem, the high priests had their flocks, their sheep, that they would sell on the Day of Atonement to those who wanted to worship God and offer a sacrifice of atonement for their sins. And if this is true, isn't it amazing to those who are taking care of the sheep that would be used as a sacrifice of atonement, the announcement came of the Lamb of God who would take away all the sins of the world. Well, I think there probably was a contest in heaven to see which angel got to give this announcement. You know, Zechariah, it says Gabriel, the, the archangel, came down. To, to Mary, the announcement came to, from Gabriel, the archangel, but this doesn't say which angel it was. So in my mind, I think there was a lottery in heaven to see who was going to be the one to be able to deliver this message to the shepherds. Because think about it, this message is what I call our, the 18 words that changed the world. The message that they gave were the 18 words that changed the world. And what are those words? Well, today... In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And they said, this this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby bundled and lying in a feeding trough. Now, again, the, the, the vivid imagery here is amazing. Consider this, folks, that this baby Jesus, God, who had come into the world, was wrapped in strips of cloth and laid on a stone slab. And 33 years later, they took his dead body off of a cross and wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him on a stone slab. Is that amazing? God's will, God's plan. And the heavenly choir cries out, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Well, in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Now think about this. These shepherds are outside, minding their own business. All of a sudden, the entire sky lights up and explodes with angelic announcement. And then they're gone. And in my mind's eye, I see the shepherds, one of them turns with the bleeding of the sheep and the crickets and said, you guys saw that too, right? I wasn't the only one who saw that. I mean, you saw that, right? Yes, they saw it. Well, we got to go and find out what this is. Let's check it out. Let's go into town. Remember the sign? They said, you'll find this baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. So they went into Bethlehem, and they went to the first house. They knocked on the door, and when someone said, what is it? And they said, "Uh, excuse us, do you know what time it is? Well, yes, I'm sorry, but do you have a baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in the manger? No. Well, then go back to bed. God bless you. They went to the next house, knocked on the door. Do you know what time it is? Of course we do. Do you have a baby there wrapped in strips of cloth lying in a manger? No, we don't. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good night. They went to the next house, from house to house, until they found the one where the baby was. Amazing. And when they found him, I wonder if it was what they had expected. You see, the angel said, 
that the Son of God would be born, the Savior of all mankind. Somehow I think that when they found him, they thought that maybe the, the manger, the feeding trough, would be lined in gold. That the gates into that place where he was would be gilded with gold and precious jewels and that there would be uh, soldiers there guarding and protecting him. But what they found was a simple stable with a, a poor man and a teenage girl who had just gone through the th throes of giving birth and a simple little baby boy wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. The Apostle Paul vividly catches this image in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, and says this, For you know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become what? Rich. Amazing. And I think that's when they realized what they were seeing. And that's when they received their unexpected present. The unexpected present of the Son of God. So what do you do when you have something that's so amazingly given to you? I mean, something that's just incredible. Maybe this year some of you are going to receive a gift of jewelry. And you're going to hold it up and show it to all your friends. You're going to say, look, he went to Jared's. And, and you know, and, and point it out to people. Look what I got. Or, or maybe uh, some of you are going to get a car. I'll take a car. Uh, maybe some of you will say, I'd like to have a car. And you get a car, you go, look what I got. Or maybe you got that electrical thing that you really wanted to have, that electronic reader or that, that, that iPad. You say, look what I got for Christmas. I'm so excited about it. And, and when you get that, you, you want to shout to the world, you won't believe what I got for Christmas. You won't believe what I got for Christmas. And that's just exactly what happened on that very first Christmas night. I want you to notice the two reactions to this story. In Luke chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, the Bible said, when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. How did Mary respond to this unexpected present? Well, Mary treasured and pondered Jesus. Mary treasured and pondered Jesus. Remember that Mary and Joseph weren't on the hillside. Mary and Joseph didn't hear the angelic choir as they announced to the shepherds that the Savior had been born in Bethlehem. So Mary and Joseph, who had gone through the throes of childbirth, were there in that stable when the shepherds show up. And the shepherds show up. I know that they just stumbled all over themselves trying to tell the story. You won't believe what happened. We're out taking care of the sheep. And these angels came, and they started telling the story, uh, recounting the scene, and probably interrupting each other and bouncing over each other because they couldn't help it. The story was so amazing that they wanted to get the message out and share it. And they gave that angelic announcement to Mary and Joseph, and they were amazed. The Bible says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. The word treasure in the original language of the Greek is, a, is an unique word. It's a combination word. It's pronounced suntereo. Tereo means to guard, like you put something in a bank or in a safe. And the, the modifier soon means that you hold it within. It means to be inside. So Mary took this message that she had received and held it inside of her. It beat within her heart. It challenged her brain, her heart, and her mind. And not only did she treasure it, but she also pondered it. An equally unique word is the word sumbalo in the Greek language. Sumbalo means to bring together, to compare. Mary listened to the words of the shepherd, and she compared them with the words that the angel gave to her when it was announced that she was going to give birth to the Christ child. And she compared them with the words that the, the angel revealed to Joseph in a dream that he was to be the father of the Son of God. And she compared it to Elizabeth, who said, The baby leapt in my womb when you came with your baby. And she puts all this together with all that she had been taught of the Word of God in her life to realize who this baby was that was in the manger. Jesus, her baby, is the crusher of Satan's head. 
the Lion of Judah, the Passover Lamb, the Bread of God, the Water of Life, the High Priest, the Kinsman Redeemer, the Good Shepherd, the Rock and the Fortress, the Wisdom of God, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, the Cornerstone, Rejected, the Bearer of all our sin, the suffering Savior, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And in my mind, I see Mary as she considers and treasures and ponders these things with a little smile on her face and a tear trickling down her cheek when she realized what God had done through her. We would do well to think about Jesus too. During this season when all the hustle and bustle amazes me as I watch Christmas specials how few songs I hear about Jesus. It amazes me when people talk about holidays that they don't refer to Jesus. And he is the reason for this season. It's all about Jesus. In fact, this whole world is all about Jesus. It is his story. It's from the beginning of the end. It's all about Jesus. And we would do well to treasure him and to ponder him in our hearts as well. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, But all those things that I thought might count as profit, I now reckon as loss for Christ's sake. Not only those things, I reckon everything as complete loss for the sake of what is so much more valuable, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have thrown everything away. I consider all of it as mere garbage so that I may gain Christ. It's all about Jesus. And in January, we're inviting you to spend 15 weeks with us learning all about Jesus. And I promise, if you will, that you will know more about Jesus than you've ever known about him in your life. And shouldn't that be the passionate desire of everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's what God wants. Well, this is the first reaction. Mary treasured and pondered Jesus. But notice the shepherds' reaction. The shepherds testified and proclaimed Jesus. They testified and proclaimed Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They couldn't wait to tell their good news. I mean, this is amazing news. This was an unexpected present. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the sheep, here comes this message of God coming to earth. And as they told the message, they stumbled all over themselves. They couldn't help themselves. They wanted to tell the story wherever they went. And why not? This is not just good news. This is the best news ever in the world. Our grandson, Thatcher, is not a really good communicator, but sometimes he wants to tell you something. And a couple of years ago, he was trying to tell us a story of something that happened at school. And he started to tell us the story, and then he got tickled because it was a funny story. And he started laughing, and he couldn't get the rest of the story out. And so he said, all right, kid, stop, stop, Thatcher, stop, and go back to me and tell the story again. So he started to tell the story again, and as he got into it, he started laughing and giggling. He tickled himself again. In fact, so much so that he fell on the floor. And we said, start again, and he tried to start again, and he started laughing again. Before long, we were all laughing hysterically. We had no idea what the story was. We were just laughing because he was so filled with joy that it was contagious. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is the message of Jesus, folks that God came to earth so that we can go to heaven. Incredible story. And our joy should be contagious. In Luke chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they'd been told. That's what a witness does. They simply tell what they've heard and what they've seen and what they believe. And they went back to work. But wherever they went, they told the story. I mean, when you get something as good as this, how can you keep quiet? How can we keep quiet? Folks, we've all heard the angelic announcement. 
If you said, I didn't, you're lying because I just told you the angelic announcement. And we've all looked at the evidence. It's profound. And most of us deeply believe that Jesus is the Savior born in Bethlehem. We know it's true. How can we keep quiet? We live in a world that is dark, a world that is hopeless, a world that is hurting, a world that is fearful. Maybe even more so than the days of the shepherds. Today's world is filled with pain and and, and fear and hopelessness. The need is as great as ever. How can we keep quiet? The shepherds just simply told what they had heard and seen and believed. They just spread the word, and we can do the same. We have the same opportunity. How can we keep quiet? You see, just like the angels who heard the message and shared it, and just like the shepherds who heard the good news and shared it, each of us has been given the unexpected present, the privilege and honor to tell the world the greatest news ever. And we can begin by simply saying, you won't believe what I got for Christmas. Say that with me, would you? You won't believe what I got for Christmas. One more time. You won't believe what I got for Christmas. And when someone says, what is it? You simply tell them this news. Luke 2, 2, 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. All that we would ponder and treasure Jesus and that we would proclaim and testify to this world. But that's your decision. What will you decide today?